David Hackett Fisher, author of Paul Revere's Ride. Who is Quentin? Uh, Quentin uh, is uh, one name for the, of the horse uh, that I learned the, my equestrian lessons on. Uh, uh, I, it took many falls. Uh, it's uh, to, be, to require a thousand falls before one uh, uh, masters that, that side of it. Uh, Why were you on a horse? I mean, what relationship did Well, actually, it started independently at Paul Revere, but uh, the, the, uh, the two issues developed at the same time. And uh, I began to have a fellow feeling with, uh, with Paul Revere. Uh, I, uh, there are moments in his accounts of the ride uh, that I think only a rider can really understand. Have you taken uh, the ride? He, we, I have taken parts of it. I've ridden long parts of the route. It, mostly it's asphalt and not recommended. I think for some parts of it, horses would not be permitted. I doubt Paul Revere could get through these days if, if he had to, had to travel the whole way. But. Why did you feel the need to, to do it yourself? Uh, well, to, you mean to do the... Uh, to, right. to Well, I felt... Uh, it, it, it's, I wanted to share the experience. Uh, I wanted to have a sense of, uh, uh, of, the, of the place and the presence. And uh, part of it also was walking the, the, the battle road uh, uh, that the British uh, troops uh, retreated on. And there was one moment uh, on the uh, hill. No, it would have little meaning to anybody who, uh, who hadn't been through the, the, the records uh, uh, first, but uh, a hill in, in Lexington. It was the hill where the militia of, of Lexington uh, made a stand as the British returned uh, from Concord. And I, I walked that with the superintendent of the National Park Service, and it was on an April day, just the same sort of uh, climate as that April 19th. And the hill is just the same, we think. It has, has changed very little. And there is a sense, more than anywhere else, more than the bridge, more than the old North Church, of, of that moment. I think it was very moving, I think. Too. In the back of your book, um, you have, Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Uh, I found myself able to say a little bit of that. Why do we know that, and what is it? Well, that's uh, Longfellow's version of what happened. Uh, and, uh, Longfellow is the, the man who made Paul Revere a national hero. He was very much of a New England uh, folk hero before that time. Uh, but Longfellow was writing in 1861, and he was trying to make a point. Uh, the point was mainly as the Civil War was coming on, and many people were in the agony of a decision. Uh, Longfellow was, was saying that one man alone could turn the course of history. He was trying to persuade people in the North to do as Paul Revere had done. And uh, that gave a kind of special interpretation to his version of the event. He made it into a solitary act. Uh, Paul Revere did everything by himself. Uh, he had one solitary henchman, a kind of Sancho Panza for this New England knight errant. And uh, uh, Paul Revere got his, uh, did, uh, worked his own way across the river in the poem and received the signals and then rode by himself. And I found a very different uh, sequence of events, a much more of a collective effort. Uh, well, this book began with uh, 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 two discoveries. The first was how little had been written in a serious way about the ride. Uh, 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 not much in the way of a, of a full-scale history. Uh, much in the way of rhetoric, poetry, uh, two popular biographies. Uh, but no historian had ever published a book on this subject before. And the second discovery was how much there was in the way of primary material uh, that one could work from. Uh, we have new uh, possibilities that way. We've got uh, computer-driven finding aids so that now we can locate uh, the diaries that were kept on April 18th. And uh, from that material, we began to find, I say we, it was my students and I working together, uh, that there a lot of people were involved. Uh, we found 60 other rioters who were out that same night. And it seemed to me that far from detracting from Paul Revere, they actually made his role more important uh, in that he was uh, more than just a messenger, he was an organizer. He, he was a, a, a man who would get things done and uh, he belonged, he was a great joiner, he was an associating man. Everybody seemed to know him. I want to ask you a lot more about Paul Revere, but for, you actually got me to laugh out loud on the Mother Goose story Yes. in the back. Um, could you tell that before we... Well, it's a story that I was told by the staff at the Paul Revere House. Where is that? This is in the north end of Boston, uh, on, on North Square, right at the heart of the north end. And uh, about 300,000 people visited every year 
Many more uh, walk the Freedom Trail. And uh, quite a number ride tour buses. And the tour guides uh, are uh, always looking for something to, uh, to liven their uh, conversation. And uh, the uh, head of the Revere House said she was amazed to, to have some of the visitors ask. She said, is it true that Paul Revere had an affair with Mother Goose? Uh, Mother Goose is also thought to have been a, a Boston uh, heroine, uh, ap apocryphal as that story may be. What? It is not true. Uh, Paul Revere did not have an affair with Mother Goose, uh, um, but uh, a tour guide was, 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 was working with that idea. Here's the front of your book, your cover on the book, and it's a portrait of Paul Revere. Who did it? It's done by John Singleton Copley, and uh, that, that for me is the, is the starting point of the book itself. Uh, the, uh, the, I, the portrait, I think, uh, has much to tell us about this man. It's, it looks at first sight to be a simple, straightforward representation of an artisan at work. Uh, but when we study it, it turns into a very complex optical structure. If we look at it, we can see that, the, that Paul Revere is uh, sitting at his work table, one hand uh, cradling his chin, the other holding uh, of a, a, a teapot resting on what was called a hammering pillow. And if we look closely, we see it's a web of, of reflections. Uh, the, the man himself is reflected in his work table. Uh, the fingers that made the, the, the silver pot are reflected in the silver uh, uh, surfaces. We look again and we can see that there's a window reflected in that uh, pot. And it's a window that opens outward on the town of Boston. And Paul Revere is looking outward through that window at his community in a reflective mood. Uh, and I believe that that artist who knew him very well, John Singleton Copley, was his fellow townsman, uh, captured him brilliantly in that web of reflection. How old is he in this? He's about 35. He was born in 1735. The portrait's about 1770. And when was the actual date of his ride? April 19th? April 19th, uh, begins April 18th uh, and runs into April 19th, 1775. Okay. This, was, this was 1870 when this was taken. I mean, when this was not taken. This was, seven, this was five years, uh, approximately. We don't have an exact date for the portrait, but uh, it's, it's approximately 1770. What was he doing then? He was a silversmith, uh, he called himself a gold and silversmith, uh, worked in, in Boston. Uh, had many activities, many interests. Uh, he was, uh, the, he was, uh, he was a, a, a great uh, a, a joiner of organizations. He uh, belonged to Masonic and helped to found uh, Masonic organizations. Uh, he was an artisan, uh, in, a member of various artisan groups. Uh, Let me stop you and ask you about a, a Mason. What would a Mason have been back then? What would they have stood for? Well, they were, this was a, a, a benevolent Christian fraternity that had spread uh, very widely through the, through the Western world. Uh, many of the revolutionary leaders were Masons. Uh, many British leaders were, were Masons. Uh, and uh, we see um, there, when Paul Revere was captured at the end of, uh, of his ride, the British officer who caught him uh, used a very curious phrase. He said, may I crave your name, sir? And uh, a, Mas a Mason tells me that may have been a Masonic password. And that these two men were identifying themselves to one another, even as they were on opposite sides of that, of that conflict. Before we continue on Paul Revere, why should anybody care about him today? Well, I think he had a, a message for, for us as well. I, to me, the interest of, of the story is, is partly that. Uh, I think uh, we can see a, a kind of message, first of all, in what he was doing. And for me, it was mainly a kind of collective effort in, in that cause of freedom. And, Oh, we forgot about that. We forgot about both sides of it sometimes. I think people on the left today, uh, some of my colleagues at academe, uh, tend to forget about American ideas of freedom. Uh, people on the right tend to forget about collective action. And uh, Paul Revere and his friends uh, br brought those two things together. And I think that's a, that's, a, uh, that's a message for us. If you go back to the cover again of your book, um, if, we, of course, you pull out on this, we can see what's around it. What are those spires on either side? The uh, spire on the right uh, is the Old North Church, which was the tallest building in Boston, and that's where the, the lanterns were displayed in, in, in the North End. Uh, the spire on, on the right was uh, Paul Revere's uh, a, a church called the, the Cockerell uh, 
a church where he worshipped, where his, his uh, mother had uh, been a member uh, before. And uh, behind is a, is a view of the houses of Boston. And he was very much a product of that, that community. There was a kind of rallying cry that was heard in the streets when the fire broke out. Uh, when the revolution began in 1770, the Boston Massacre, the cry was, town-born, turnout. And uh, this man was very much a product of that, of that community, and that it was a communal effort in his purposes. Uh, he had an idea of freedom that's different from ours. Uh, for us, uh, freedom means uh, personal entitlement. It means uh, individual autonomy. Uh, for Paul Revere, it was that, but it was also an idea of a community uh, running its own affairs. And that meant a sense of personal responsibility to that community. And he had a kind of balance in that idea, which sometimes I think we've lost. I think that's another meaning, another message for us today. How many people lived in Boston? In, in About 15,000. 1770. 1775. It had grown very little for about 50 years. It was a town that was in trouble. Uh, uh, it was uh, in, in, in caught in a world depression that began in, well, in the early 1760s. Uh, there was a special kind of edge to it in 1765. Paul Revere himself was in court for debts he couldn't pay. And uh, this, that was the year when the Parliament, the British Parliament, also imposed taxes on America itself. Parliament itself caught in that depression. Who ran the and, town? Uh, the town was run by town meeting. And uh, the town meeting was, was run partly by a group of organizations which were the first that we know of to be called caucuses. Uh, there was a North End caucus, a South and a Middle caucus. Uh, they'd all been founded by the father of Sam Adams, and Paul Revere was a member of the, of the North End Caucus. It was one of many groups that he belonged to. Who was Sam Adams? Well, Sam Adams uh, had been a uh, family that uh, had been in the brewing uh, business. Uh, uh, Sam Adams himself uh, was, uh, was in uh, some considerable financial uh, trouble. He was deeply devoted to his town. He became, one might almost say, a kind of professional politician. And uh, when he was painted by Copley, uh, he is uh, holding the charter of Massachusetts in one hand. Uh, and the records of the town is, are, are before him. And uh, there's a sense of austerity, of, of a kind of a devotion to, to, to that cause. What's the relationship with Sam Adams to John Adams or John Quincy Adams? They were, they were cousins. Uh, Sam and, 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 and John Adams were, uh, were cousins. And uh, John Quincy was the son of, of John Adams. Uh, they, uh, 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 both of them were well known to, to Paul Revere. It's a very small world that they, they were living in. Where do you live? I live in a town called Wayland, uh, which is 20 miles due west of the Boston waterfront. It's now part of a kind of suburban sprawl, but uh, it's a town that was uh, founded uh, before 1640, uh, and it doesn't think of itself as sub-anything. There's a sense of pride and uh, history in the New England uh, towns that, that are the Boston suburbs. What do you do full-time? Well, I teach at Brandeis and write these, these books uh, and try to bring those two things together. I have always tried to link my writing and my teaching, my uh, students uh, often help with the, with the, both as paid research assistants and uh, they'll, be, they'll be working on parallel projects. And then I try to teach my courses around the books that I'm, I'm writing. And I think that kind of union uh, makes for better teaching and better writing as well. Where are you from originally? I'm originally from Baltimore, uh, born and raised uh, in Maryland, deep roots uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the Maryland countryside and uh, married a Yankee and uh, have lived for 30 years uh, in Massachusetts. Where did you go to school? I went to Princeton uh, for, as, for my undergraduate work and then to Johns Hopkins in, in Baltimore for, for my graduate training. What's a Yankee? Well, a uh, Yankee is somebody who's a little bit north of you are, I suppose. Is, uh, I, uh, my North Carolina cousins regard Marylanders as Yankees. Uh, I, I, I think, for me, a Yankee is a New Englander. And uh, it's, a, it's a very special folk culture that uh, I've written another book about, uh, deeply rooted with a, a very strong sense of its place. And Paul Revere was, was, his, it was both uh, uh, French and English. He was uh, uh, also very much part of this Yankee world. Talked with a very strong Yankee accent. We know from his spelling, when he and his friends uh, 
spelled charter. They spelled it with the two T's and one R, or no R at all, chatter. And he spoke with that sort of a Boston accent. I think that's a clue to his bond with this folk culture. How many books have you written? I've written eight, to 20 on how one counts on various subjects, almost entirely in early America. Which one was the biggest seller? Well, uh, the biggest seller is actually a book of historiography so far. It's uh, called Historian's Fallacies. And it's uh, been uh, fairly widely used for courses in, in law schools. It's a, it's a book on, on how to think historically. It's a book about logic. And it's uh, mainly about what the, I think is sometimes called informal logic. That is, uh, the logic that used to be taught, not the mathematical symbolic logic that's taught today, but structures of reasoning that are related to the field within which one is, 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 is working. This is really two books in a way, isn't it? Well, yes, you, it, it's, as to the research in the back. And also, uh, a good deal of it at the back is about the myth, the, the legend of Paul Revere, and how that changed uh, through time. Why did you decide, you know, what is a historiography? Well, historiography is the study of history, and it's, uh, it, it means, uh, for some people, it means a history of history. Uh, for others, it means a study of historical method. Here, it's mainly about uh, the myths uh, and the way they've changed through time. It's, uh, I think uh, that's a subject that's as interesting to me as, as, the, as the event itself. One of our recent guests was James McPherson from Princeton. Uh, writes a lot about the Civil War. In your acknowledgments, he kind of leads it off. Uh, what did yes, he, well, he and I were in graduate school uh, together, and then uh, we have found ourselves uh, moving on parallel lines in at least some of, some of our work. Uh, uh, his uh, history of the Civil War, uh, Battle Cry of Freedom, uh, is built partly around an idea of contingency, that is, uh, things hanging in the balance of uh, moments when it might have gone one way or the other. He's got four major turning points in the Civil War, and that gives a kind of architecture to his interpretation of, uh, 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 of that event. And I've been very much interested in contingency as well, uh, perhaps in a slightly different sense. For me, this is a book about people making choices. Uh, Paul Revere, General Gage. Uh, the book has really two protagonists. Uh, one of them is the British Commander-in-Chief. Uh, there were many other people who had, to, had major choices to make. Uh, I think that one of the uh, major players in all of this was General Gage's wife, uh, who was uh, Margaret Kemble Gage. Uh, she was an American, uh, deeply loyal both to her husband and to her own uh, country. And she felt uh, cruelly divided. And there is evidence, circumstantial evidence, we're, that we can't know for sure, but evidence that when Paul Revere and Joseph Warren were trying to discover what General Gage was trying to do in, on this expedition, uh, they, they had a secret informer who may well have been Margaret Kemble Gage. She had a choice to make. Uh, General Gage had choices to make. He was an English Whig who was trying to hold the empire together, but within what he spoke of as the rule of law. And uh, he never declared martial law before these events. Uh, he could have arrested Paul Revere. His uh, superiors in London were urging him to do that. But he made choices, and his choices were to act within the letter of, of the law. He was a believer in English liberty, which meant a, a system that operated under the laws that were passed by Parliament. And he tried to be true to that, and it may have made a major difference in the, in the outcome. Back to James McPherson, because there was a... You mentioned that you were together on the Delta Queen at one Yes, point. Uh, we were doing a Princeton alumni a college, a Princeton and Johns Hopkins, uh, refighting the Western battles of the uh, Civil War. And uh, actually, before we, we, we began doing that, we were exploring the Western rivers, the, the uh, Cumberland uh, and the Tennessee in particular. But first we thought we'd, we'd uh, visit some of the sites ourselves just before, and we tried to get uh, close to Fort Henry, uh, which is uh, now actually in the Tennessee River. It's underwater. And uh, we drove down, got a little bit too close, and uh, our car uh, sank in, into the river mud uh, there, and we, uh, at least I had some reason to reflect on contingency and the choices we had made uh, just then, and uh, I, it helped to focus my thinking. Uh, I, I have a major debt to, to Jim in the work that he's done on this. When was the first year that you thought about doing a book on Paul Revere? Well, actually, I didn't until about 1992. And 
I was uh, asked to give a, a lecture to the uh, Massachusetts Historical Society and looking for something that would be suitable. And they happened to own the Revere family papers and the three accounts that Paul Revere himself left of the ride. And so I thought, well, maybe a, a, a short paper might be got out of this. And then I got into it and, and uh, found that there was so much more to be, be done. It grew from, from that into this book. How'd you go about it? Well, first, uh, reading the uh, major uh, primary accounts that Paul Revere had left, uh, there are extraordinary riches that way. This was an event uh, that people called the Lexington Alarm. Uh, and uh, the alarm was, the, was a sort of event that we know very well in the 20th century. It was like um, the assassination of President Kennedy. It was an event that people never forgot. Uh, they remembered everything they were doing at that moment, the moment when the news reached them. And in uh, the 18th century, they wrote their memories down. And so we have uh, diaries, uh, we have memoirs, uh, we have uh, pension applications. Uh, people who had to apply for pensions uh, were forced to, to write a narrative of their, of, of their revolutionary service. And some of these men served at Lexington and, and Concord. Uh, immediately after the, the Battle of, of Lexington, uh, the Whig leaders uh, tried uh, to um, collect depositions to prove that the British had fired the first shot. And we have uh, many, many depositions. Uh, so altogether, hundreds of these events, of these accounts of the event. And got a map here. I just want, you've got this in the book. This is called the Middlesex al Alarm. Yes, that's the, uh, uh, that's the spread of the, of the, of the news. Uh, of the, the, of the, not, this is the spread of the warning from uh, on the evening of the 18th, 19th, before the battle. I just want to show the audience um, Where's Boston and where is Lexington and Concord? Well, uh, Boston is, is to the right of that uh, map. Uh, Over here? Uh, it's uh, just right. a little above your uh, finger. Uh, Boston is right here. Okay. Well, we'll and get a real close shot of that and people can see that. We can see Cambridge there and Boston to the right. Yes. And then uh, Lexington and Concord are on a line. Cambridge, Lexington and Concord are running. Uh, a, a, a west northwest uh, from uh, from Boston, and what's and, the distance uh, between Boston and Cambridge? And it's about six miles from the Boston waterfront to Cambridge, about uh, twenty miles from Boston waterfront to, to Concord. In seventeen seventy, we've got Paul Revere in this portrait you've got on the cover here. Right. How many? He was married twice, but how many children did he have? He had 16 children, 52 rare grandchildren that we know about, thousands of uh, descendants uh, today. Uh, the uh, staff of the P Revere House uh, welcome many of them. They, they tell me that a remarkable number look very much like the Copley of Paul Revere. They arrive in 10-gallon hats and uh, from many parts of the world, but, uh, but uh, they, uh, they, they do... Uh, uh, resemble their their ancestor was he married when he was 35 in this yes portrait? Uh, he was he was uh, had uh, married his he was then in, uh, married to his second wife uh, Rachel Revere who's also a player uh, in in these uh, events and Rachel acquired a very large uh, family and then eight uh, children there were by the first marriage and then there were eight more by the uh, by the uh, second and um, Paul Revere actually wrote to one of his uh, French cousins that uh, he had at least 16 children, quote unquote. And uh, we wonder if there may have been yet others that we, that we that he wasn't sure about. You, went, you told us that in Boston it was run by um, a local council. In Boston it was run by a town meeting. Town meeting. But uh, yeah. what control did the British have over the people of Boston in the year 1775? Well, uh, General Gage had... Uh, Proposed General Gage was horrified by what he called. He was one of the first to use the word democracy in something like its modern meaning, applying it to the institutions of New England, and he persuaded Parliament to pass a set of acts that they called the Coercive Acts. Uh, the uh, Americans called them the Intolerable Acts. And one of them was uh, two of them uh, transformed the government of Massachusetts, and uh, uh, one of them uh, came very close to abolishing town meetings. Uh, General Gage was, uh, was actually trying to shut down uh, town meetings, except as administrative bodies. And uh, so there was really a, a head-on collision between these men over ideas of representative uh, uh, government. Uh, 
when did this, I mean, let's go to the title of this book, Paul Revere's Ride. What was the atmosphere leading to the, the ride? The, uh, it, 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 one beginning point uh, would be in the fall of 1774, uh, when General Gage was trying to do s another part of his uh, program, which was to disarm the people of New England. And he thought that the way to do that was probably to seize their gunpowder. Uh, they could not manufacture their own gunpowder in quantity in 1774. And so in September, he uh, seized the largest supply in, in Massachusetts. And this caused something that was called the powder alarm. It was uh, an, another event that people always remembered. Uh, and uh, Massachusetts, uh, the towns were horrified that, uh, uh, that their, their, their right of resistance would, would be threatened in that way. And uh, that uh, galvanized uh, uh, many people, and uh, amongst them, Paul Revere. He organized a, a kind of intelligence organization, a, a voluntary association, uh, composed mainly of his fellow mechanics in Boston. And what they tried to do was to keep very close tabs on what General Gage uh, was, was doing. And when th there were signs that General Gage was striking at the next major powder supply, which was in New Hampshire, uh, Paul Revere made an earlier ride up to, Pro to Portsmouth in very bad weather, December it was. And he got the message there before uh, General Gage's troops uh, could seize that powder. And then there were a series of other events like that in the, in the winter in which the two sides are increasingly coming to the edge of, of hostilities. Did he ride to Portsmouth, New Hampshire on his own? Yes, he did. And uh, he made many rides uh, uh, before the, the midnight ride. Uh, he uh, had a horse at a stable in town. And he'd been picked first in 1773 to take the news of the Boston Tea Party, a kind of explanation as to what Boston had been, been doing. And he what was the Boston Tea Party? The Boston Tea Party was uh, where the uh, people, the men of Boston, th broke into the tea chests and threw tea into, into Boston Harbor. It was an act of violence, very carefully controlled. They even replaced the locks on the tea chests to make clear that they were not, uh, their, their quarrel was not with property. And whose property but were they throwing away? They were, they were throwing away the East India Company's tea, uh, which uh, carried a tax that, that they didn't uh, wish to pay. And uh, in, in the, that this was an act of violence, there were many moderates in America who were, sh who were uh, taken aback by it. And, Paul Revere was asked to ride to Philadelphia, New York, to explain what had happened. And after that, he made at least five other rides to Philadelphia and New York and helped to organize an American uh, resistance. And this all in the period from December 1773 uh, to, uh, 70, to April 1775. So we're in April of 1775. This, the actual ride was on the 18th and 19th. It was on the 18th. And, uh, uh, General Gage uh, was, uh, again, uh, thinking about seizing more munitions and uh, had been ordered to, uh, to, uh, to, to move with more force and, and speed in London and uh, decided to strike at, at Concord. Uh, how, by the way, how uh, many British troops were in Boston? Uh, there were about 4,000 on April 18th and uh, about 900 uh, were sent. It was something like 900. Uh, were sent to Concord. Uh, these were the, uh, the cream of the army. They were uh, special units that were called grenadiers and light infantry. They were attached to the British uh, regiments in Boston. And they were uh, put together in a provisional force and sent out. And then when, an, uh, when were they uh, sent out? To they were sent out on the 18th at about uh, 10, 10 o'clock was when they mustered. At night? At night, uh, in, uh, just uh, on the backside of Boston Common. And then were rowed across the Charles River uh, by the Royal Navy. And uh, this was by sea. This was the, the two if by sea uh, that then uh, caused Paul Revere. One if by land, two if by sea. They, they, they could have gone another way. They could have gone out across Boston Neck, a very narrow peninsula uh, that connected Boston to the mainland. What does that refer and, uh, to, the one if by land, two if by sea? Well, this was uh, a warning that was uh, to be sent uh, uh, out of uh, Boston uh, by lantern signals in, in case uh, Paul Revere himself was unable to, to get clear. Uh, and he'd made arrangements with the Whigs in Charlestown. Uh, he knew, had a network of friends over there. And the signals were to be displayed in the highest building in Boston, which was the steeple of the Old North Church. Uh, and as soon as uh, Paul Revere and Joseph Warren discovered that the British troops were moving by sea, that is to say across the Charles River, uh, then uh, Paul Revere uh, went to uh, ask his friends to display those lantern signals, another group of, of people whom he knew.
And then off he went to find yet another group who were uh, watermen, boatmen in, in Boston. And they rowed him across the Charles River. And there he met his friends in Charlestown, and they'd found a horse for him and uh, took him on his way. Uh, it got started on his ride. But, but uh, you know, leading up to the lantern in the North Church and the steeple, did they have that well organized? Did they know? Oh, did oh, they know? Elaborately organized. Uh, uh, organized in, in many different ways. Uh, the uh, Paul Revere uh, had a problem with the, the idea of displaying the, the lanterns there. The, the old North Church was, was Anglican, and the minister was, was Tory, and they're so unpopular in town that the church was closed. Uh, but Paul Revere knew the sexton of the church, and he knew one of the vestrymen, and he asked them to, to take a hand in, in, in that work, and, the, and, and they did it. Uh, if you were a Tory back then, and a Whig, what would be the difference in your, what were the main differences in your philosophy? The, the main difference was really o over the question of uh, whether to resist uh, British uh, rule or to, uh, or to support it. And I think it came down to two ideas of freedom. Uh, uh, those two ideas that Paul Revere and uh, General Gage personified. On the one hand, the sense of, of self-rule. On the other hand, the idea of the rule of law under Parliament. And they were two ideas, two ideals uh, that these uh, they, uh, uh, groups were, were, were uh, fighting for. And they didn't call it the American Revolution. Uh, they called it a civil war. And it was that way for, for, for most of them. Here's a, a 1931 painting by Grant Wood. Uh, yes, why is this in your book? Well, that's in the, uh, the chapter on the, the, the mythology, and uh, there we can see a kind of modern version, a 20th century version, of the Longfellow interpretation. Uh, we see Paul Revere as a, as a solitary figure, uh, galloping all by himself uh, through uh, uh, sleeping a New England uh, uh, countryside, awakening each of these individual farmhouses. And that wasn't at all what, what happened. Uh, it was uh, so many people working together, and what all of them did was not to knock on individual farmhouse doors, but to awaken the institutions of New England. It was a collective effort in that way as well. So on that night at uh, 10 o'clock, 900 uh, British soldiers take off to Concord. That's right. They go across the water, and then, and then onto uh, what road? Then, well, they, uh, the, the crossing point was chosen for secrecy uh, from the most remote part of Boston to an uninhabited part of Cambridge. And when they got across, they discovered the reason that it was uninhabited was it was a swamp. And the uh, British troops were, were kept in that swamp until between 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Where was Paul Revere at this time? Paul Revere was, uh, by, by midnight, he had gotten to Lexington. And uh, by 1 to 2 o'clock, the word that had gotten, been carried by other uh, messengers as far as the New Hampshire border, which was uh, nearly uh, 30 miles north of here. And that was, uh, these were 18th century uh, times and distances. Uh, that was normally a long day's uh, journey. Let me ask you, if Paul Revere wasn't there that night, would the people of Lexington still been tipped off? Well, that's one thing historians never know, uh, but my hunch is he really did make a difference. And uh, he made a difference uh, uh, mainly in the preparations before the ride, uh, in organizing the effort. Uh, this couldn't have been done spontaneously. Uh, it, uh, the British uh, commanders uh, thought that the American troops must have mustered uh, a day or two days before their march, which they didn't do. Uh, but only by that kind of collective effort could this have happened the way that it did. And I think only with, by the, with the organizing skills of people such as Paul Revere could that effort have been brought together. How many people lived in Lexington? In Lexington, about eight to 900, something like that. It was very small. It was a dairy town. It was very, very scattered uh, population. Uh, the town center, only a few houses uh, around the green. What's there now? Uh, now, I don't know what the population is. I would guess uh, 20,000 probably. But if you go there, what's the now, green now? Is there much to see? Uh, the green is remarkably unchanged in the buildings that immediately abut it. There's been uh, a, 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 few, a few buildings have been added. The meeting house is gone. Uh, there was a meeting house uh, on the eastern edge of the green, and that, that was uh, pulled down. Uh, but the Buckman Tavern, the building, a big building standing to the north, is still there. Uh, and uh, about uh, four houses are still there that were, uh, that were there on, on the night of April 
18th. Uh, he's on his horse. He's headed toward Lexington. What's the, d the distance between Charlestown across the river and Lexington? Well, he went in a roundabout way. Uh, he was, uh, 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 got onto the Lexington uh, uh, road, uh, which uh, would have taken him directly there. And as he was uh, moving toward Lexington, he saw two uh, British officers uh, in the shadow of a tree uh, just in, uh, ahead of him. And they were a patrol, part of a patrol that General Gage had sent to stop uh, Paul Revere. And uh, Paul Revere uh, pulled his horse around, rode back at a gallop, and then north to another town called Medford. And this took him in a long, looping detour uh, to, the, uh, to, uh, to the north and then to the, to the west, uh, and uh, took him safely around those, uh, those patrols. The British officers gave chase, and one of them went cross-country right into a clay pit. And uh, the other tried to, uh, uh, to pursue Paul Revere along the road, uh, but Revere was very well mounted and, and, and got away. There's another, and, uh, go ahead. Say there's another man uh, by the name of Dawes, whose uh, yes, ancestor then, eventually became vice president. That's right. States? And uh, that William Dawes was sent out, and perhaps a third rider as well. Uh, were sent uh, from Joseph Warren's office in, in Boston. Dawes took a different route, uh, whereas Paul Revere went by boat to Charlestown and then riding north to Concord. Uh, Dawes went by land across the Boston Neck. It was, it was a southwesterly uh, route that then took him uh, swinging to the, to the north. Have you taken that and, route yourself uh, in preparation I, uh, for this? I, I've, I've walked that and, and ridden it. I, I didn't ride. That's through a very congested part of it. You walked the, the whole area. way? I've, I've walked the whole way various times. So and go back to the British soldiers have captured Paul Revere. How the British many? soldiers, uh, well, I should say that uh, first Paul Revere, going from Medford, gets around uh, to, uh, to, to Lexington. And uh, he rode to, from Lexington Green to the, uh, a parsonage uh, where uh, Samuel Adams and John Hancock were staying the night. Uh, the, the message he carried was actually addressed to them. What was John Hancock and, uh, doing then? Uh, well, he, they had been out attending meetings of the Provincial Congress, uh, which had been meeting in, in Concord. Who was he? And uh, he was a leader of the, he was a, perhaps the richest man in Massachusetts. Uh, he was described as the milk cow of the revolutionary movement. He, uh, he, uh, his, he first supported uh, uh, the revolution. And he was out attending the, uh, the Provincial Congress with, uh, with Samuel Adams. And uh, uh, Paul Revere, uh, uh, brought his message uh, to the house, and there was a guard out front. And the guard was a, was a, a sergeant in the Lexington uh, militia uh, who did not know Paul Revere and was not impressed by this uh, midnight uh, apparition and uh, uh, told Paul Revere not to make so much noise. People were trying to sleep. And uh, Paul Revere said, noise. He said, you'll have noise uh, enough before long. The regulars are out. And it's interesting what he did not say. He did not say the British were coming. Uh, none of those riders uh, said the British were coming. Where'd that come from? And it came with the grandfather's tales that began to be told in the 19th century. But in 1775, these men still thought that they were British. This was a civil war for them. And so they, they spoke of the, the regulars, the redcoats. If they'd been to Harvard, they said the ministerial troops are out. But they never said the British are coming. Now, how far the, was it, by the way, between Lexington and Concord? It was, it's about six miles. Uh, between Lexington and, and Concord. So did he wake up John Adams, uh, I mean uh, Samuel Adams and John Hancock? He, he woke them and uh, they uh, talked. Uh, about half an hour later, uh, uh, Dawes arrived uh, and they all agreed to that uh, Concord should be warned uh, quickly and that uh, Revere and Dawes were the men to do it. So off they went again, uh, 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 riding on a second ride from Lexington to, uh, toward Concord. Along the way, they met a, a physician who'd been out that night uh, uh, courting his fiancée. Uh, his name was uh, Dr. William Prescott. And they uh, told him what they were about, and he offered to help. And uh, so the three of them rode together uh, toward Concord. And they got about halfway to Lex to, to, into the town of Lincoln. They were uh, knocking on doors as they went in that part of the, of the trip. And then suddenly Paul Revere, who was a little bit ahead of them, saw in the distance another two British uh, riders. Uh, he said very much in the same position as, in, as those in, in, in Charlestown. And uh, he uh, turned back to his uh, friends and uh, he said, in effect, he said, there are three of us, there are two of them. He said, let's attack. Uh, he was, uh, the, the adjective that was attached to Paul Revere in the street ballads of 1775 was bold. He was a very uh, forthright fellow. Uh, 
And uh, so they went uh, charging toward the two uh, British officers, and suddenly the two officers turned into four, and then into eight, with pistols in their hands, and Paul Revere was captured, and he and, and uh, Prescott and Dawes were herded off toward the north side of the road into a pasture. And as they went, William Prescott uh, whispered to Paul Revere in a Yankee dialect, he said, put on. And they both uh, put their spurs to their horses, and Paul Revere galloped to the right, and William Dawes uh, went, uh, and, and Prescott went to the left and got clear. Uh, Paul Revere was captured, and Dawes went back into the road and, and, and got away. Uh, and uh, there was a very interesting encounter between uh, Paul Revere and the British officers who captured him. Uh, they asked him who he was, and he said, my name is Revere. And they said, what? Paul Revere? They knew him well. And uh, they, uh, they were armed, and their uh, 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 pistols were at hand. And uh, yet it, uh, Paul Revere in instantly began to interrogate them. And what uh, he did was to ask them what they were doing out at that night on that, on that road. And there was a, a, a process in which the captive himself uh, regained a kind of initiative. In that, uh, in that exchange. And what he was trying to do was to move those riders away from Lexington, away from the Concord Road, uh, telling them that, that the militia had been alarmed, that 500 men would soon be in, in Lexington Green, uh, that they were in danger, the British uh, soldiers. What's, th what's this in the back of your book? Well, that's another part of the myth. Uh, that's uh, Paul Revere as the iconoclast of the 1970s uh, saw him. Uh, that was uh, this uh, another uh, around in the, the mythologizing in which the Vietnam, uh, some of the writers of the Vietnam generation uh, were not only debunking our, uh, the figures of, of the past, but uh, making Paul Revere almost into a kind of villainous figure who they said betrayed his cause by um, singing, as they said, to his British captors. And this is a picture of Paul Revere as a canary uh, singing to his, uh, to his British captors. In fact, he didn't do that at all. He was... Uh, uh, he, he wasn't betraying his cause, but serving it in, in, at that moment. How did he get away? Uh, well, the British uh, uh, let him go. They decided that they had to carry his news back to the British column, uh, the news that the, uh, that the countryside was alarmed. And so uh, they went uh, off at a high rate of speed to the east, uh, and, and Paul Revere was, was allowed to go free. Where'd he go? On the, he went uh, back to the parsonage, uh, back to see if if uh, Sam Adams and John Hancock had got away. And he discovered to his horror they were still there. They were still debating over what they should do. What time in the morning and, is And this? Uh, this was now about uh, between 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. And so he uh, uh, persuaded them to get, uh, to get clear of Lexington as quickly as possible uh, and uh, helped them on their way to another parsonage <coughs> farther into the countryside. And then he came back. And he met the clerk of John Hancock, who said there was yet another job that had to be done. John Hancock had left the secret papers of the revolution in the tavern at Lexington Green. The clerk's name was John Lowell. And he asked Paul Revere if he would help carry off those papers. So back they went uh, to the Buckman Tavern on Lexington Green, and they went racing up the steps, and there they found a huge trunk that still survives today. Very heavy. They had trouble picking it up. They, they went, as they, as they bent over the trunk, uh, Paul Revere looked out through the window. It was now nearly 5 o'clock in the morning, almost sunrise, about 4.30 perhaps. And in that gray light before the dawn, he could, was one of the first to make out the sight of the British troops coming up toward Lexington Green. So out they went uh, from Lexington Tavern with the trunk between them, staggering across Lexington Green. They went passing through the Lexington militia that were mustering there and uh, carried their trunk beyond. And as they went beyond, they could hear the commander, uh, Captain Parker, telling his men, don't fire first. Stand your ground, but don't fire first. Captain Parker's on the side of the militia. He, was, uh, he is commanding the, the Lexington militia. They were not Minutemen, by the way. This was a company militia. And, uh, were they trained? Uh, they, were, they were trained. Many of them were veterans. Uh, uh, probably more than were veterans uh, than were in, in, the, in the, British, the first British companies that came up. They had served in the in the French and Indian War, as, as Parker himself had done. Had there been any conflicts at this point in this country between the British redcoats and any rebels anywhere? There had been uh, two. Uh, one was uh, at, uh, at Portsmouth. Uh, this was part of the powder alarm when Paul Revere got the word first, and there were actually uh, shots fired uh, there, and, and one British soldier was wounded. And then uh, the first blood was spilled at another powder alarm in Salem, and this was in February of 17. 17... 
75. So there had been small scattered episodes before, uh, but no, 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 no big one. At what point, at what time uh, that morning was the first shot fired and who fired it? It was just about sunrise, uh, just about five o'clock. And uh, Paul Revere was behind the, uh, the American militia, uh, heading away from them. And he heard behind him a, a shot ring out. And he looked back, and he couldn't tell where it came from. Uh, he thought it sounded like a pistol shot, but he couldn't be sure. And uh, many other uh, people who were there thought they saw it come from uh, several places. Uh, the Americans thought that a British officer had fired first, not the British infantry. But there were several officers mounted in front. They were, in fact, the patrol that had captured Paul Revere. They'd gone back and joined the column. They were, they were uh, still in a, a state of, of, of panic, almost, uh, from, from, uh, uh, as they had been since they'd met Paul Revere. And they may have been the first to fire. Uh, the British eyewitnesses were quite sure that it was an American who fired first, uh, perhaps a shot out of the Buckman Tavern. Uh, there were young men there who'd been drinking, uh, who were armed, and uh, it could well have been a young uh, a Lexington man named uh, Solomon Brown. That's possible. Uh, we don't know and we'll never know who fired that first shot. How many people were killed uh, at Lexington? There were, uh, there were seven people who were killed. And um, everybody agreed on the field what happened after that first shot was fired. Uh, the British infantry fired a volley uh, into the American militia. And uh, that's what, uh, then the, um, the militia were scattering, were, were dispersing, uh, and uh, uh, a few of them fired back, not many. Uh, no British soldier was killed at Lexington. Uh, one was wounded, and uh, the horse of one of the officers was hit. Uh, but it was, a, it, Lexington was a very one-sided uh, affair that way. At what point did Paul Revere go on to Concord? Uh, Paul Revere had, had, had gone earlier to Concord, uh, not to Concord, toward Concord. He never got to Concord that day. Uh, he had uh, he'd gone, to, gone toward Concord about 1 o'clock, had been captured, come back, uh, uh, met Hancock and Adams a second time, then had tried to get the trunk away. Did anybody go to Concord and warn them? Yes, uh, Dr. Prescott got through. And uh, he was the man who alarmed uh, the towns around Concord. He kept writing... Through, uh, through the town. He went also to his house. Uh, his father was a physician, his brother as well. And uh, physicians uh, owned uh, the best horses in town. They, they uh, spent much of their time uh, traveling through the countryside. And uh, uh, Prescott's brother, Abel Prescott, uh, took the word south. And these were amongst uh, two of those 60 riders who, who, uh, who spread the word. There's an awful lot more to talk about, but uh, there was something that I wanted to get you to expound on. I'm looking for it in the book. Um, as you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Nathaniel Hawthorne and Henry David Thoreau and Louisa May Alcott are all buried there in that cemetery in, in Concord. But you have a whole list of people that Wadsworth's, what, grandfather? Henry These Wadsworth? were the, uh, the, the great writers of the mid-19th century were the grandchildren of the men who were at uh, uh, Lexington and Concord. A, a remarkable number of them uh, had that connection. Uh, uh, the, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson was the uh, a grandson of the minister in Concord, uh, William em Emerson, who had uh, been very active uh, in the revolutionary movement there. It actually mustered for a time with the, with the militia. Uh, Henry David Thoreau was the, the grandson of a, of a soldier who served as a private, actually later in the Revolution, under Paul Revere. Uh, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's uh, uh, grandfather had been a general uh, in, in the Revolution. Uh, Herman Melville was the grandson of a Boston Whig who had uh, been in the Tea Party. And uh, these were the, they had grown up on the grandfather's tales of the Revolution and became great uh, tale-tellers uh, in their own right. How did you write this? Well, it uh, began as a lecture and then grew into a book different from the books I've written before. This was uh, much more of a story. Uh, mostly, as uh, so many historians have been doing, I've been doing monographs, uh, uh, works that are organized more in terms of analytic structures. And I, I think I and uh, my colleagues have tended to uh, 
lose touch with the storytelling part of, of history. And so a large part of this book was to tell the story. It's a, it's a story that's remarkable in that it's perhaps, one of my colleagues says, it's the only historical event he can think of that conforms to all the Aristotelian unities of time and place and action. It has a kind of dramatic intensity that rarely happens in historical events. And it also has an immediacy and a, and a, a richness of detail that we don't often get. You have an uh, acknowledgments that Jacqueline Jones tested several chapters on two young critics in her household. Yes, Who uh, is that? she is. A, a, a Jackie is my colleague at, at, at Brandeis. Uh, my uh, my five colleagues who uh, uh, are all the faculty of an American program in American cultural history at Brandeis uh, were very supportive of all of this. And uh, Jackie has uh, two uh, young uh, 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 children at home who. Uh, how young? Uh, uh, they are, I'm not uh, sure of their ages exactly, but uh, they were old enough to be uh, critics uh, and were uh, helpful in, in, in that way. You mentioned uh, your uh, wife Judith and John Henry Fisher That's and my father, Miles. And Miles is my brother. Uh, these are all family uh, enterprises and uh, especially on this book, my daughter uh, Susie, uh, uh, who uh, took time from her uh, career as a barrister in London to help with English uh, materials and uh, also to uh, was it was a critic uh, she was a history major in in college and uh, and it, it is I think uh, one of my toughest critics what your wife do she helped a lot she has her own career she uh, having raised a family has gone back to get her own uh, doctorate and is now uh, a, 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 a teaching biology at uh, Leslie College uh, and uh, even so found time to, uh, to help uh, on some of the research trips and uh, also a critic. Uh, Who's Norma Fisher? Uh, Norma's my mother. And uh, she contributed helpful advice and support. Uh, yes. Uh, your, your father, uh, John Fisher? John Fisher, yes. He, did, he read a draft of it, did he do anything else? Yes, they, uh, they, they read drafts of it and uh, were very helpful. Uh, I, I rely much on the wisdom of, of my father's advice. Uh, Kate Fisher, Ann Fisher, Frederick Turner, John Anderson Fisher, William Pennington Fisher. These are children's nephews and nieces, uh, 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 all of whom were pressed into service at every opportunity. Where did you write this? I wrote this in Wayland, uh, Massachusetts, mainly. How do you in, write? In, in my I mean, study. What, physically? I, uh, I, I, I write every morning. Uh, I find that uh, writing is, first of all, requires a kind of uh, discipline. It has to be a habit. Uh, and I think uh, every writer has to build that sort of structure in, 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 into his work. So uh, I make a, a habit of, of, of writing every day, no matter what. Uh, every so day every, now? Every day traveling, every day, uh, uh, every holiday, I find uh, an hour uh, uh, to write. Write longhand? Um, no, I, I work now on a, on a uh, computer. Um, and uh, I find that very, uh, giving me much more control over the... Over the, the, I, it, I found it, uh, it's not an easy thing to tell a story, I find, particularly a story of this complexity. And the, uh, the, uh, the computer helps in, in any number of ways. Uh, in your historiography in the back, you, 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 you paint a picture of, a, uh, of the celebration of the bicentennial at the North Bridge in Concord with Jerry Ford and Pete Seeger. There were, uh, there were two, uh, there, was a, there, were, there, were, there were two groups that met on the, on the field. Uh, on, uh, on in 1976, there was a kind of official uh, a bicentennial, and then there was something else called the People's Bicentennial, uh, both uh, laying claim uh, to the to the founders and to the and to the event. Were they did they celebrate this together, or were they, they were they were both on the same field? Uh, the same thing happens very often. Uh, uh, when we were uh, uh, at the last uh, Patriots Day celebration, just here in, in just in 1993. Uh, the followers of David Koresh uh, were there uh, with signs uh, demonstrating against uh, 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 the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And uh, it's an occasion in which uh, many Americans uh, make, a, make a case for their idea of freedom, often in conflict with other ideas. What's the connection between Paul Revere and the Vietnam War? Well, I think uh, Paul, the, the legend of Paul Revere went through yet another uh, uh, transformation. Uh, there was a, there's been an odd rhythm in the 20th century. Uh, Americans will celebrate uh, Paul Revere, uh, uh, particularly in moments of, of, of crisis. Uh, 
of the Civil War, as Longfellow did, and then again in World War II, uh, when Esther Forbes uh, wrote a very good popular biography uh, that made Paul Revere into a simple artisan, in her phrase, who became a, a representative of an ordinary American capable of extraordinary things. And this was published in the year of Midway of Corregidor. And uh, then uh, after that, uh, Paul Revere became a cold warrior. He became a kind of businessman on horseback uh, and uh, was a sort of symbol of the union of capitalism and democracy. And suddenly there was a reversal that coincided with Vietnam. And uh, Paul Revere became the target for many American iconoclasts. Uh, the author of that cartoon that you showed a, a, a moment ago. Singing Canary. The Singing Canary. And uh, very different from the debunkers of the 1920s who made him into a kind of uh, clown. But he becomes a truly uh, villainous figure in, for, the, for the, the iconoclasts. Uh, and then it's reversing again today. And all the things that you saw and the places you went, if you were going to advise somebody who wanted to go trace these steps or see Paul Revere, as a candidate, what would you suggest? Well, I'd say uh, travel the, the battle road. Uh, there is a stretch of the battle road that runs uh, through Lincoln. It's called the, a stretch it's called the Nelson Road. And it's as near to the condition of that countryside uh, in 1775 as any part of it can be. It's a country lane. And one can get a feeling there. Where would you go uh, look for artifacts? Well, the artifacts are everywhere. Uh, they're in the museums. Uh, What's the best? We were, uh, well, uh, they're, they're, uh, the, the, we were astounded to find the spurs of Paul Revere in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We were even more astounded to York. find them again, yes, in the Smithsonian. And uh, we've been finding spurs of Paul Revere uh, in other places as well. Uh, 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 a good place to go is the Paul Revere House, which is maintained. It's the only 17th century house that still stands in what was old Boston. And uh, it's maintained by the Paul Revere Memorial Association and uh, is, is worth a visit. Uh, Our guest, I'm sorry, we are out of time. I didn't mean to cut. Do you want, want to finish that sentence? Well, I was going to, to, to mention the Old North Church. Uh, Can uh, you go and see the Old North Church? And the Old North Church is open and welcomes uh, uh, visitors as well. My apologies. We are out of time. And this is the book. It's called Paul Revere's Ride. And the author is David Hackett Fisher, a professor at Brandeis University. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me.